out of habit. Is there a laser pointer? Or, or if there isn't, I can, okay. If that doesn't work, I can just use a mouse. Okay. Is, is this already on? Hello? On the square thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, you mean, right? So. Oh, I'm muted. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Okay. Very good. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I'd first like to say I am going to be talking about topography, but in a very, very different sense from what uh, Peter uh, was, was discussing. Um, very little on the sort of a neuroanatomical topography and more about topography in the external world. I will have some speculation at the end that does sort of a, address some of the topics that were, that were in Peter's talk. I also just want to thank the organizers for putting this together um, in such a beautiful location um, and for inviting me to, to participate in it. Finally, and perhaps the most important thing I want to say is that I am uh, essentially a messenger here. I'm not, uh, uh, not the, the, the most important contributor to this work by a long stretch. This is really uh, from beginning to end, the brainchild of a very talented ex postdoc in the lab, uh, Cam Kang, Ming, Ming Dong Kang, um, and he, you know, he showed up in my lab with sort of the embryonic version of this project already in his head, um, and uh, 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 proceeded to do just wonderful things with it. So I'm going to be telling you today, my presentation right here. Okay, good. Um, a, a little bit about uh, comparing olfaction to the, some of the uh, more long uh, uh, or, or, or uh, systems that have been studied for a longer period of time. And that is the vis uh, visual systems and auditory systems. And one of the things that um, we make great use of in our visual systems is the ability that with a single glance I can look out in this room and not only might I recognize familiar faces and know the identity of people in the room, but I also have immediate direct access to your position in space, right? I know where you are from a single glance. I don't have to search around the room to localize each one of you. Um, and that also happens in other sensory systems too, um, and, and, and uh, one of the most famous examples of that is in the auditory system where, for instance, I mean, we, we can certainly do a version of this uh, ourselves, but specialists like this barn owl are really, really good at, in complete darkness, uh, the ability to localize their prey just from the sounds that their prey um, you know, uh, uh, is making. And so, you know, they, they would be able to, again, identify something about the characteristics of the sounds and maybe make some guesses about what it is, but also the sounds themselves convey positional information about where that uh, object is in the, in the outside world, okay? Now, how does that happen? And really, there are two very fundamental ingredients in being able to localize cues from the external world. The first one is, is that there, there has to be some mechanism to preserve any spatial information that's present in the physical stimulus itself, right? So in the case of the visual system, you know, light coming from the sun scatters off elements of this tree here. When it hits a point on the tree, light goes in all directions as it bounces off of it, unless it's a mirror or something like that. And so light goes all, all different directions, and two rays that emerge from the same point, if your eye did nothing, they would strike different spots uh, on, on your retina, even though they were coming from the same physical external position, and it would scramble the spatial information available um, in, uh, uh, in the light. But your eye has optics, which, which essentially, if you will, performs a computation on the wave runs coming from the, from the tree, and focuses the rays that are emitted at two different angles back down known to a point on the back of your retina. And light rays coming off at different angles from a different point, of course, get focused down to a different point on your retina. And so the, the, the optics of the eye are the physical apparatus that preserves the spatial information present in the, in the stimulus itself. Now, that would all be for naught, of course, if the nervous system didn't go to some care to maintain that kind of information, right? And so you're all uh, well familiar with the, one of the most famous sort of observations in neuroscience, and that is, is the so-called retina, retina uh, uh, topic projections, right? So that different spots on the retina project ultimately to, you know, th through the LGN to different uh, positions in visual cortex, right? Um, and so that, that spatial map, neural map, 
preserves information that's present in the spatial information of the physical stimulus itself. And that's, that's not, of course, a complete answer to how you localize stimuli, but, it's, but it's an, these are two necessary ingredients in order to be able to localize stimuli. The situation is a little more uh, complicated or, or less obvious maybe in the case of audition. Audition seems like a difficult case to do full localization because you essentially have two sensors and you would imagine that your two sensors, your two ears, would let you make, say, two measurements, two independent measurements of something related to the position of, 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 of a sound source in space. Um, and you might uh, therefore wonder if you only are making two measurements and yet you want to localize, let's say, the direction to a sound source um, uh, you know, somewhere in the outside world, you'd need to triangulate the position. You'd need, need at least three measurements in order, to, in order to actually do that computation. And in fact, um, you can do that with your two ears because your ears can actually make multiple, extract multiple parameters from the sound stimuli that arrive. So for example, in, in, in this horizontal plane, the uh, slight differences in the arrival time of the sounds to your two ears gives you an indication of the angle in the horizontal plane of the sound to the source. Um, the external shape of, of, of your ears, and this is taken to an extreme in the barn owl where they're actually asymmetric. One ear is sort of tilted more upward, the other one more downward gives you two different intensities, um, and that, that difference in intensities is then used to estimate the angle in this direction, right? So in a sense, you have two sensors, the two ear holes, but you're making four measurements of one kind or another, and that's enough to, to compute an estimate of the, of the exact direction of the stimulus in the outside world, right? Okay, so, um, so that's the sort of physical side of the, of, the, of the auditory system. How might you be able to preserve the, the, the information, the spatial information, the raw stimulus itself? And then, of course, you also need the neural hardware to make use of that. And again, a really beautiful set of stories, um, many decades old at this point, um, have identified uh, uh, many of the uh, contributing neural mechanisms. And for instance, in this case of computing the time difference in the horizontal plane, there are these elaborate circuits that, that use delay lines and look for coincidences of arrival times of, uh, of excitation um, in order to essentially map the spatial position in the outside world to a receptive, spatially receptive field uh, in, in, in the auditory uh, system. Okay, so both of those share this physical apparatus and then the neural hardware um, to, to preserve that information. Okay, so what about olfaction, right? So um, I think olfaction has long been viewed as being in a very different category from these two senses in terms of the ability to infer information in the outside world. We talk a lot about the identification of odors in the sense of is it lemon, is it, is it you know, uh, strawberry, something else like that. We don't talk as much, of course, about, the, uh, uh, about localizing stimuli. That's not to say it's not a crucially important phenomenon, and there's been a lot of work that's been done on that. I'll, I'll remind you of a little bit of that uh, right now. But one of the main reasons why people think that the localization of, of external world objects from smell is a complicated one is one that's been mentioned, I, I think, a couple times already now, uh, here, uh, uh, most recently in Tristram's talk last night, and that is the sort of plume structure of, of odorants, right? So these show some very old images of, of a pipe that's streaming out a, 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 a fluid with a, with, a, with a tracker in it, and what you can see is immediately at the emission point of the pipe, these come out in these sort of very nice sort of jets, but then they tend to break up over time and they form these uh, dramatic filaments. And the exact shape of, and structure of these plumes depends greatly on the parameters that are involved in the system. But one of the key things that's, uh, uh, to, you know, to, to keep in mind is that if you're a point so sensor somewhere out here, the direction from which one of these filaments sort of crosses you is not necessarily very informative about the direction. It doesn't immediately give you a vector to the source of the odor, right? I might be standing here. I might have a filament sort of slap me across the side and might think it's therefore over that away. But in fact, the source of the odor, odor is, is, is essentially in that direction, right? And so it's not an immediately reliable indicator of the direction uh, and uh, uh, you know, to the source of an odor if you simply looked at, at, if you had some way of sort of sensing how these filaments sort of swept across your face, right? And so 
um, that's given rise to some, some uh, active interest in some, uh, exploring some very different ways of localizing stimuli. And that is, is that through the accumulation of evidence over time. And Massimo uh, Vergasola had a really lovely paper uh, on this, um, uh, essentially providing an algorithm that maximizes the amount of information with each step that you take in an environment. Sometimes you take daring steps in directions that you think might not be productive, but in order to sort of check your hunch about where, uh, uh, about where the source of this odor is. And over time, you can fairly efficiently find your way to the source of that odor. Okay? And you know, I think it's very clear that this sort of general kind of phenomenon happens. right? Um, and um, uh, you know, that, it's, that it's especially maybe Im important for, let's say, thinking about a moth in a large cornfield where uh, you know, the, the gap to a potential mate might be you know, 10,000 or, or more times the body size of the animal. So you're really looking for these rare distributed sources, in, uh, sparsely distributed sources in, 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 in these very large landscapes. However, I would say, so well, I, I, I uh, have not a shred of doubt that this phenomenon happens. I would actually say that for mammals, this is not the only kind, uh, only way that olfaction is used. And in, and in part, I think this comes from a lifestyle difference. Mammals tend to live at very high density, and so, uh, or often live at high density, and so simply sort of finding, uh, uh, you know, f finding each other isn't always the, the hardest problem. But the other thing is, is that animals tend to pay a lot of attention, not just to scents that come wafting through the air, but scents that are right in front of their noses on the ground. And this is a video of a, taken from, by a head-mounted camera uh, on the dog, now one on the side. And this dog is just being led on a leash, but it's, it's a trained tracking dog, and it's following the trail of someone who had just walked through here before. And what you can see is that the animal keeps its nose right on the ground, right? It's not, there's not, it's not scenting this thing from 300 meters away with its nose up in the air. It's really trying to follow the trail on the ground as the, as the animal progresses forward. And these uh, you know, trained animals, or, or, and of course wild animals, can follow these tracks at incredibly high speeds, right? If the a human handler were willing, this dog would, would be following this track on the run, right? And so that's a fairly impressive accomplishment when you think about it, the ability to sort of parse out the spatial information about the, about the trail in, you know, at high speeds as, as the animal's breathing and therefore only episodically sampling the, you know, the, the, the information in the outside world. Okay, so, the, so uh, what Cam was asking when he first came to the lab is, you know, might there be more information than we thought about the sort of spatial direction of an odor um, than just simply this sort of integration of information by, by uh, you know, directed exploration. And so w w one of the most important differences between this air scenting um, and this ground scenting is the distance between the source and the nose. Um, and um, so, and, 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 and in particular, if the speeds of flow or if there's very little flow or the, if the speeds are relatively low, airflow exhibits a property uh, of being so-called laminar, which means basically that the streamlines uh, uh, exhibit sort of very smooth characteristics. And you can illustrate that actually quite easily. So this is a mouse that's been tracheotomized. We have two pipettes here that are both going to puff out uh, a, a, a uh, a bit, essentially a bit of smoke. We've actually digitally colored them differently, but it's really the same tracer in both cases. These are actually taken as two separate movies and then superimposed on top of one another. And we've tracheotomized the mouse so we can provide an inhal inhalation as we puff odors out of these tubes. Now, one of the things that I wanted to sort of say is, is that I think one of the reasons maybe that this hasn't really been sort of noticed before is that as olfactory, say, physiologists, what we tend to do is we tend to sort of, for instance, if you're delivering a stimulus in, in sort of, let's say, even in the old anesthetized uh, days, uh, you know, to the animal, we would put a nose cone over the animal. We would flood the entire sort of area surrounding the nose with the odor. That way, we knew the animal was getting it with good kinetics and all this. And that sort of rapid filling of the entire space, of course, would cause you to lose spatial information. And the key thing about the way that Cam's puffing out the, the tracer here is he's, he's letting it out in dribs and drabs, right? And to, be, to be very specific, 
the flow rate outside of these tubes is significantly smaller than the total bulk flow rate into the nasal cavity, right? So it's really that the sniffing is drawing the odor in. It's not that these are hosing out massive quantities of, of, of odor, right? And that's really crucial for being able to, to see these kinds of phenomena. So if you just hear a little video, um, you can see the two tracers here uh, entering the nostril, and I'll play it one more time. And what you can see is, is that the spatial information from these very close sources seems to be preserved at least up to the entrance of the nose, right? And so that at least opens up the possibility that perhaps there might actually be some spatial information available in this cue that's coming from the outside world. Yeah. 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 You're, you're basically basically sagittally, yeah. Um, yes, exactly. That's right. Yep. Yep. Very good. Oh, and I should say, please do interrupt me during my talk. So um, I will do this so I keep note of time. All right. So uh, it, it's, it, I, I would call these uh, wuss, wussy sniffs, right, in the sense that we're not, we're not really trying, in, in everything I show you today, we're not really trying to mimic the sort of onset and, and drop off of sniffing. We don't do any exhalation or anything like this. In this case, this was just a steady draw on the, on, on, you know, through the trachea, and we just simply puffed out the odor, and so essentially there were valves that just simply gated the tracer in that case, right? So, so sort of the, the actual sort of dynamics of the acceleration and all this kind of stuff I think are certainly going to be important, but there's little, there's little reason to suspect that that dynamics is going to fundamentally change the trajectory, the, 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 the actual sort of positions that are traced out by the individual odor and you know, molecules, right? So it'll, it'll, it'll change the speed with which they traverse it, and I'll get to that a little bit later on in the talk, but it doesn't change the, change the spatial distribution very, very much. Yeah, yeah, we're pulling it. Yeah, so we're, we're through the tracheotomy. We're mimicking the sniff, but it's not a very it, it's not a very realistic mimic of the of, of the sniff, right? So. Yeah. I guess I'm Is that picture from two nostrils? It was uh, only into one nostril, right? You show it there. Yeah. Yeah, you're looking for the side. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Yes. Uh, it's 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 essentially a, it's a th theatrical smoke machine. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. Photoshop. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Okay. So okay. So if you want to find out can the animals do some kind of spatial localization with odors, the most direct way is to ask the animal itself, of course, right? And so what Cam uh, set up was uh, uh, was a uh, you know head fixed assay, and he had. Two tubes that were co delivering constantly uh, delivering a flow of air. There was a suction tube, not really shown here, um, to draw away uh, all, uh, anything that's produced, sort of symmetrically oriented on, on the body axis of the animal. And um, uh, there would, uh, he would train the animals to uh, lick in response to the presentation of, of an odor, in this case, isoamyl acetate. He would deliver uh, you know, isoamyl acetate either from the left or the right. Um, and, and, and he would swap them on different trials. And the animal was rewarded only if it was isoamyl acetate and only if it was coming from the left, right? He also did two different concentrations, both 10 parts per million and one part per million um, in, in, in air dilution, um, and to, in, to make sure that there was essentially, uh, uh, you know, that it wasn't a, uh, essentially just a concentration threshold um, that, that, that was being detected. And uh, so after a certain amount of training, um, the animals could certainly tell left from right quite easily. Um, so shown in red here is the frequency of, of times that the animals lick. The main part of the training is to get them to stop licking whenever it's not going to be productive. And what you can see here is the animals lick very reliably when it's uh, isoamyl acetate at 10 ppm or 1 ppm. They don't lick, you know, they hardly lick at all when it's coming from, that, from the left. They hardly lick at all when it's coming from the right. And if you use uh, 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 phenylethyl acetate, uh, different odor, then, then there's no licking whatsoever, right? And so this shows that the animals can reliably 
uh, distinguish odors coming from the left and coming from the right. That doesn't prove that it's olfaction that they're using. They could be using the wind, for example, right from these from these two two cues. I um, mean, you'd have to sort of come up with why would the flow velocity be different when there's isoamyl acetate rather than air. But of course, all these things are, are theoretically possible. So CAM had to do a number of controls to to determine whether they were really using olfactory cues. So, for instance, if you cut the whiskers, which might be one mechanism of using the canosensory cues, it doesn't really affect their behavior. Um, he he did a number of other. I'll, I'll talk about this one more in a second. Um, but but you know one of the most important controls here is to close the right nostril. In that case, they seem they behave. We interpret it as they behave that the odor is always coming from the left. That's the rewarded side. So they look on every single trial. And then if on the very next day, you reopen the right nostril and close the left nostril, then essentially they never lick. And that's consistent with interpreting as they always think the odor's coming from the right-hand side, because that's, that, uh, uh, you know, that's where they're drawing in the odor from. You can also inject them with this magical chemical whose mechanism of action really isn't fully known, but it, it, it seems to reliably and seemingly fairly specifically wipe out olfactory sensory neurons, and that really sort of shuts down the behavior altogether. So that shows you that you require olfactory cues. They at least have to be permissive. It doesn't necessarily, that by itself doesn't prove that they're instructive, right? But taken together, I think these, these you know, controls argue that the animal is using olfactory cues um, uh, uh, for its behavior uh, to, to solve this horizontal task. I would, now, I, I, I want to say that this is not really a surprising result. There was a, a previous publication in 2006, again, suggesting that, that rats can smell in stereo, right? Yeah, it's always, it's always simultaneous. And in fact, there's always flow coming from the two directions. It's just a question of whether it's been doped with odor or not. Yes, right, and they meet in the middle, and it seems likely that there is a little bit of, of crosstalk, right? We, we don't have a direct measurement of that, but, but, but yeah, exactly, that's right. So it's... Yeah, yeah, exactly, right, yeah, and that, I mean, that's what we think is, is happening here, exactly. Yep, right, so this is just essentially a replication of that, of that previous work. Yeah, so, so it's entirely possible that they are using additional cues to do this, right? So, the, I mean, the, the narrow occlusion simply shows that the, so, something entering the nostril is an important component of that. The, the diclobenyl injection argues maybe a little more directly that it's probably olfactory, but because we don't know the mechanism of diclobenyl um, and, and uh, you know, because it could be permissive and not, not necessarily only instructive, you can't rule out. But, in, but it, what it does show is there's certainly some sort of chemosensory interaction there that is driving this behavior, right? So. So what? You, you, I, I still have a hard time hearing you. So, so, so you're saying the concentration? Oh, you're saying what if it's slightly different? Oh, that's the reason for the control of 10 ppm versus 1 ppm, right? Ah, yeah. Yeah, right. So, in, so you're absolutely right that, that you could essentially come up with a lookup table um, for doing this. If you imagine that there's a slight bias in the concentration between the two sides is basically what you're saying, right? I mean, to within our, lib, our, the ability, our ability to calibrate it, there isn't such a difference, right? But you could, you could argue that there might be. Yeah, exactly, right, right, exactly. And, and I, I guess I'd say that one of the other things that, that, so this tubing swap, I guess I'll bring it up here, right here right now, those kinds of things are actually turned out to be really important controls because animals can also cheat all over the place and the cam had to work quite hard to make sure that they weren't cheating on this task um, in, uh, under certain conditions. I can get to maybe any questions. Um, and so the tubing swap essentially controls for the possibility that just the different sides are emitting different contaminant, contaminating odors, for example. Okay. All right, so um, I, I want to address one. I, I often get questions about, about this kind of thing. Is one, uh, one possibility is, is that this isn't really being solved by stereo olfaction from the two nostrils. Um, maybe it's actually being solved um, by sequential sampling, very much in the same way of the, of the, the Vergasola mechanism and, and just the general concept of, of accumulating information over time about where the odor source is. 
And, and so here you can see that even though it's a head fixed preparation, there's a little bit of nose movement at the end. And one might wonder, is that actually what they're using to determine the side that it's coming from? And the main, there are a couple of things um, that, so, so we can't rule out the possibility that they're getting some information from that. But one of the things to point out is that the sequential sampling works essentially equally well, whether you have one nostril or two. And yet the fact that when you make nostril manipulations, that, that, that the animal's behavior acts as if it's really a, 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 a stereo effect that is happening argues against the, the, the uh, interpretation that, not, that nose movement and accumulating evidence over time is a major contribution to this behavior. Yes, so, so I don't have any slides to show you, but, but Cam did some interesting experiments actually where he kept it closed for about three weeks or so. And uh, over the course of a little more than a week or so, the animals start getting to about an 80% criterion uh, success rate on the stereo task, which, 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 which we thought was pretty interesting. And to be honest, that was actually what Cam was, his initial hypothesis was more fine scale uh, 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 discrimination in the horizontal plane. And the, the, the project almost died when he did a control um, and, the, and that was to do the tubing swap. And it turns out that if you have one, so if you have two nostrils open, tubing swap does nothing. The animal's behavior essentially stays perfect, right? If the animals have learned the task to perform an 80% or so over three weeks, you say, wow, they can do it even with one nostril, but then you just simply just swap the tubing. The, 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 they actually flip in their preference. So it's contaminants in that case. They're cheating in the task when there's only one nostril and they're not, they don't seem to be cheating when there's two. Exactly. Yep. Yep. No, that's uh, diclopenil. Uh, sorry, that's a systemic injection. It's not. It's not. We're not like injecting it in the nose or anything like that. Is there what? Zinc sulfate. Yeah, you're right. We, we, I guess we could do zinc sulfate. We haven't. We haven't thought about that. Is it, what, what, what would? So you, you would say that that would be. That's essentially just to argue that not only is nostril are nostrils important, but the actual it's factor. Level of science, level of yeah. 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 Charlie. So totally yeah. That's true. That's a great idea. Great idea. Thanks. That, 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 that's what this is. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. No, no problem. It's, it's an important thing. Okay, so where I think the, okay, so, so, so this is cool, but it's not new, right? I mean, we, there, there's been, there have been you know, pub, published, uh, publications previously on sort of serial faction in the horizontal plane. What was really new was that Cam discovered that like the barn owl, not only can they do the, the, the horizontal plane, they can also do the vertical plane. And in fact, they only need one nostril to do this, right? So here's an animal where one nostril has been permanently closed. Now the odors are being delivered dorsally and ventrally rather than left and right. And you, get, you again take the animal through the same training procedure. And again, the animal can perform really, really well. And again, we, so now you can't close the one remaining nostril because the animal can't breathe. Um, but you, you can do a number, of, a, a number of controls to, again, convince yourself that the animal is really using olfactory cues here. And a lot of, some of these are the, are the exact same, uh, same controls. He did a few more in this case. Um, and so for instance, the pressure reduction is essentially just, again, a, a yet a new way of looking for uh, mechanosensory uh, uh, controls or timing information. And then uh, you know, the one that sort of makes the behavior go away is when he dopes the, the clean air line with a small percentage of isoamyl acetate. And that, I think, really argues very convincingly that it's, again, chemosensory driven. Ah, no, no, sorry, I'm not showing, I'm not really showing that the, 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 this is just showing repro reproducibility. The training period for these two, for these two tasks is about the same. It's about three weeks or so to get the animals up to, a, I mean, depends on where you set the criterion threshold, but roughly speaking, that, that's the case. Oh, yeah, no, this is really, well, well, well or, or let me, let me back up. It, it. It's, it's as if it were proximal in the sense of the, the, the tubes are actually about a centimeter away, but because of their large diameter and because we were very careful to use laminar flows, in a sense, it's, it's, it doesn't matter what the distance is as long as you don't break up into turbulence. Right? Yeah. What is the, what is the flow rate? Yeah. 
Uh, I don't remember the number right now. I can I can get that number to you though. Yeah. Yep. The airflow from that particular right. Yeah, yeah. So it could be right, but but, but if you just simply don't, so it, every so for instance, like in this case here, right. Everything is exactly the same. It's the same pressures that are being used. It's the exact same sequence as a valve, uh, you know, va valve openings and closing. All the tubing is exactly identical. There, that, there, and the only thing that's happened is he squirted a little bit of isoamyl acetate into what had been the clean air jar ahead of time, right? And so, and this completely wipes out the animal's behavior, basically, right? And so, um, uh, so, so I, I, yeah, I think that pretty convincingly argues that it's not mechanical anyway. Okay, let me let me let me move on here because there is there is more to tell. Okay, so this argue that together, like the barn owl, even though there are only two nostrils, the mouse seems to be able to infer the di the direction of the of the odor source in both the horizontal and the vertical and the vertical plane. One more. <laughs> no, we don't control. This is the animal's freely behaving. Yeah. I'm not fully sure. Can we talk about this during the coffee break? Yeah. Right. Okay. So okay. So okay. So Cam wanted to. So the natural question is, of course, how on earth does the animal you know, solve this task? You have only the two nostrils. How do, how do you get enough information to sort of triangulate the direction to an odor? And so what Cam reasoned is that you had to have the two components that I mentioned at the beginning. There has to be a, the physical apparatus inside the mouse's head to preserve the information that's present in the in the actual external cue, and then uh, you know there must be the neural hardware that also preserves this information, right, for the, for, for use by the nervous system. Correct. It's only not intuitive. Yeah, there's, there's no surprise about the horizontal. The vertical is the really surprising one, exactly. And so to try to understand how this happened, Cam decided that he had to take a closer look at the actual anatomy of the nasal cavity itself, right? And so what he did was, was uh, he took high resolution CT scans, about 10 micron resolution, of three different animals doing their entire nasal cavity all the way back to the curviform plate and a little bit beyond. And um, I was impressed. I shouldn't have been if I had known the literature well enough, but I didn't. I was impressed at the extreme reproducibility of the turbinate structure of the, of the three different animals. It, it's an insane level of, of reproducibility. And so then, so he got you know something like a thousand to fifteen hundred different slices from these CT scans, and you know sort of towards the tip of the nose, the structure of the nasal cavity is rel relatively simple. And as you progress farther and farther backward, and the turbinate structure becomes more and more elaborate, you can see that there are just these astonishing, uh, astonishing labyrinthine structures here. And uh, he ended up uh, uh, deciding that to, because the, so there's actually tissue and he wanted to include the, the actual space for the tissue, and you can see that in the CT scans, but a lot of the automated algorithms that we tried didn't work. He actually laboriously traced by hand uh, all, of his, all of his sections, and, uh, and then if you essentially throw away the original images and just put together the tracings, then at that point he was able to build a three-dimensional di three digital model of the morphology of the air passageways in the nasal cavity, and that's what's being shown here. So a medial view of the air passageways. Here's the trachea, so, right, so here's the tip of the nose. Here's the trachea down here. And so you're looking at here from the medial face, from essentially the center line of the animal. Here you're looking from, from uh, laterally from the outside of the animal inward, and here are the, here are the, the turbinates, uh, you know, the cribriform plate would be, would be right here. Um, and you can see here from the back and, and from the top. Okay, and then what he did was he used this 3D digital model of the mouse nasal cavity, and he had it 3D printed in a transparent material. Um, and, um, and he did that because he wanted to actually be able to trace the flow lines through the nasal cavity and actually see what the, what the pattern was. And so he had this apparatus for delivering odors from different angles, and, and, and uh, both in elevation and azimuth. 
Here's the model itself. Uh, it's not quite as transparent as we would have liked, so we focused a lot of our analysis uh, on the so-called dorsal meatus, which is the part of it that had the best visibility, both from above and from the sides, so that we could actually map three-dimensional positions. Um, it's a scaled model. It's scaled up seven and a half times um, uh, compared to the actual wild type one. And because we're going to do the tracing in fluid, because there just aren't that good mechanisms for tracing in air, um, you have to then, of course, match certain parameters. And the important pr parameter match is a number called the Reynolds number. And uh, br uh, you know, briefly, without going into detail, what you essentially end up having to do is, is, is choose the solution that this is immersed in. Um, in terms of its kinematic viscosity, and set the flow rate of the bulk flow rate through through the through the model, so that this ratio essentially matches the size, the scale magnification of 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 the system. And so here are the numbers that we used here. I should say that to get the exact physical behavior, there's a second number that you should match, which is called the Schmidt number. That takes into account the diffusion of of molecules. Right. This just this just accounts for the flow. So this should perfectly match the flow. There's also diffusion. We're not matching the Schmidt number, right? So this physical model does not take into account the diffusion of, of the molecules. OK. So using this, we could get at least reasonable quality visualizations of the flow patterns of the nasal cavity. And I'll show you what the real data look like here. So here we're looking at the nose model again. The trachea is this way. Tip of the nose is over here. And Cam's going to release a little bit of just, it's just a calcium carbonate tracer in this sucrose solution. Um, uh, and when, you re when he releases that, you can see the actual travel through the nasal cavity during, again, a virtual sniff. This is just under constant draw. And what you can see is, is that it doesn't fill the entire nasal cavity, right? Not all portions of this sort of uh, mock olfactory epithelium receive the odor. And essentially, just one small portion of the olfactory epithelium was exposed to that. And again, you would get a completely different answer if you hosed the, the odorant out at high speed here, right? Because you'd fill the entire passageway, and then it would cover the entire epithelium. And we've, we've, we've done that. Um, this only happens when the draw, the source of the draw, is coming from sniffing, right? Over the time, so calcium carbonate is a, is a little bit more dense, but over the, these time scales, it won't it won't play a role. Yeah. I would actually guess if we've actually done a little bit of modeling, I, I don't think I uh, have any slides to show on that. But but actually, I, I think for certain odorants, actually, the absorption is is probably an interesting and relevant effect, actually. Um, and I can comment on that maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so, base, so, so in general, basically, if, if the odorant comes out slowly, then in general, you know, and is not you know, over the, the entire area, but is a focal sort of point source of odor, then it tends to map to a particular, a small subset of the overall epithelium. Cam actually tried doing this with gold nanoparticles, um, but they all they tend to uh, they're very ballistic and they just hit the walls of things very early on. So we've, 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 we he spent about three months trying to actually do it with real world objects, and it just doesn't. It's interesting. We didn't try anything radioactive. It, it's possible that would work. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so the, the there are two, it's a great it's a great idea. I'd love to do that experiment. Um, there are a couple of issues with that. I mean, the, so one of them is is that anything that you insert into the nasal cavity tends to disrupt the flow pattern, unfortunately. And and and, and these are all fairly tiny. And so, actually, putting in enough apparatus to do imaging that I mean, there isn't an endoscope in the world yet that exists that that actually could pull that off. Uh, we would love to do that experiment. So. OK, so this is that one flow speed. Just to find out how, what kind of parameters this is to depend on, one of the first things that, we, that, that he tried was just varying the flow rate. And within limits, so, so this is overlaying three different flow rates on, in three different colors. I see this, the, the, the uh, uh, key got a little bit covered up here. But the, but the highest uh, sniffing rate, if you will, the highest speed sniffing is, is, is shown in red. Sorry, in the next, uh, the next slide. 
uh, shown in red, and then in green and blue are slower rates. And only the blue at the very slowest rate, you actually see anything different. And that's, again, because if the sniffing gets sufficiently slow that the odorant has time to spread out before it enters the nose, then it will cover a little bit more of the overall, overall nasal cavity, right? But by and large, it's essentially over a physiological range, uh, it, it, the, the actual spatial pattern is invariant. So now the really interesting experiment, if you have essentially point sources in the outside world here, we he can select three of them here in primarily the horizontal plane here. Again, color code them differently. And then if, if you deliver the odorants, then voila, you can see that these different spatial positions in the external world map to different positions on the epithelium, right? And so this gives you a physical mechanism whereby uh, external space is, is, the topography of external space is preserved. It's not only true in this horizontal axis. Remember that this horizontal axis is sort of the boring, easy example because you already have the two nostrils to solve the problem. More interesting case is vertical distribution of odors. And what Ken found here is that the important thing to do is to watch the nose model from above in this case. And it turns out that in that case, that the different positions in the external world uh, again, map to different positions in the nasal cavity, but it's in the uh, medial lateral axis, not the dorsal ventral axis. And so overall, Cam took a, uh, you know, constructed a map. I'm going to, in the interest of time, I should uh, uh, try to wrap up here. Uh, he was able to do the highest resolution in just this dorsal meatus here. There's a, a, too much scattering to really do good 3D uh, uh, mapping elsewhere in the, in the nose model. Um, and even in this one small passage, let alone the uh, availability of other passageways through the nasal epithelium, he's actually able to essentially infer that there is this map even within this dorsal meatus, and that, and that the most sort of ventral locations tend to map near uh, on the medial face of this dorsal meatus, and the, and the most uh, 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 dorsal locations map to the more lateral portion of this dorsal meatus. Okay, so... Um, at, right, and, and so the, the thing that was really surprising is, is that there's, as odorants enter the nasal cavity, there's this 90 degree, almost perfectly 90 degree clockwise rotation of the odorants so that this axis gets mapped to this axis here. And that'll be important for some of the more speculative stuff that I'll mention if I have time to get to that. Um, I might skip over this, but if there are questions, I can, I can address this. Suffice it to say that we, uh, w w diffusion is potentially an important phenomenon. We think it, it uh, redu significantly reduces the strength of this effect, um, and we've gone to some effort to try to actually measure the actual flow rates during the actual behavior itself by uh, doing some separate experiments in which we, uh, we didn't want to disturb the actual flow pattern outside the animal, so we, we would measure the actual flow rate using a thermistor, and then we would put a chest band around, uh, around there and use this to calibrate this and give us an approximate measure of the actual flow rate during the high-speed sniffing. Uh, it works reasonably well, and we can see that the animals do significantly elevate their sniff velocity, the, the actual speed of airflow into their nose when they're actively engaged in this task, and that this should help reduce the effect of diffusion. And I can go over this in more, in more detail in questions if you want. Okay, so <clears throat> all of this has been done basically with the, the tracing experiments, of course, was done with this scale model. Because of the potential effects of diffusion, Cam wanted to really have a direct measurement of, is there, again, a spatial difference in the, in the uh, neural responses um, to, to odors coming from different sources? And so he developed this really uh, uh, elegant preparation in which he was able to insert in the living, well, a recently dead, uh, this is essentially an EOG preparation, um, and, and where he was actually able to use two electrodes coming from different sides, recording from both the medial and, and uh, lateral side of the dorsal meatus, um, and deliver odorants in front, of, in front of the animal, varying the position, um, and, and, and look at the EOG responses to the two electrodes. And what he found was that um, if you deliver odorants from right and left, then the amplitude of the EOG responses are nearly identical in, 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 the, in the two cases. Um, uh, but if you, if you are delivering uh, odorants, for, uh, so, so sorry, I, I should point out here that the um, uh, red line is for the response on the medial side, the blue line is the response on the lateral side. So if the odors come from right and left, you might think that that would be the one that would give, naively you would think that would be the one that would give the biggest left-right difference in the nose if there was one, and there isn't really any difference that we can see whatsoever. But if you use the result from the tracing experiment and test the dorsal ventral axis, then you can see there's a swap, right? So when the odor 
comes from the dorsal side, the EOG is strongest on the lateral side. When the odor comes from the ventral side, the odor is strongest on the medial side. The response is strongest on the medial side. But it's about a 10% effect, right? It's not an enormous effect. And we think this is mostly due to the effects of diffusion, okay? Um, interestingly, if you change the sniff rate in, in, in this model, and again, this is just done, done through the tracheotomy, um, you can see that the information is easily present and, and, and discriminable at relatively what would correspond to the fast sniffing, and it really gets wiped out if the animal's sort of just doing baseline breathing uh, speed. So the sniff speed does seem to be an important factor in the ability to preserve this kind of information. Okay, so in the, just in the last couple of moments that I have here, I want to engage in some speculation where we're sort of going, going with this work. And again, I want to emphasize we don't, we don't have the direct proof of any of this, but I think if I don't tell you this, um, you, you won't necessarily, I think, see what we hope is, is, is the complete picture here. And that is what, what is really happening on the downstream neural hardware side. And um, as uh, Peter and others have, have mentioned uh, uh, prior to this, uh, you know that the multiple sensory neurons and the epithelium converge onto glomeruli. Um, there, there tend to be um, you know, one or more medial glomeruli and one or more lateral glomeruli for almost all of the different odorant receptors. And it's been, uh, and, and that's maybe shown here. This is the, uh, like, again, some of the views that, that, that Peter showed, and this is from one of his lab's papers, um, uh, uh, where you can see here the, the, the lateral glomerulus, the medial glomerulus, medial, it looks like two glomeruli there, lateral glomerulus there. And in, an interesting uh, phenomenon is that if you actually look at the sensory neuron axons, uh, as they come from the nose, and again, this is a dorsal view down from the top, there's actually essentially a line of bifurcation, right, where, where the more lateral uh, uh, neurons project to the lateral glomerulus and the more medial neurons project to the more medial uh, glomerulus, right? And so this actually... Uh, has all of the ingredients necessary for preserving that lateral medial split, which you remember is for, seems to actually be for coding the dorsal ventral direction of odors. And so this actually maybe gives some insight into, uh, this actually shows that in a sense olfaction is a lot like the barn owl, right? Instead of just having the two nostrils and making two measurements, there are actually f essentially four measurements being made, right? And that's because you have essentially two glomeruli, um, uh, uh, lateral and medial on each side. And that gives you actually enough information that you should be able to triangulate the position of a noter. Indeed, we actually think that, that the, the mystery we suspect, this is pure speculation, that it goes further than that. And there's a really beautiful system, so sometimes called superficial or external tufted cells, that receive input from a single glomerulus. And then they send their axons deep and then into the other hemibulb, so staying, staying within the same hemisphere, but, but projecting to their uh, hemibulb, their axon terminals lie directly underneath the same glomerulus on the opposite side. And we've not really had a clear idea of why there are these two glomeruli per, per uh, receptor type and why these cells project directly to the opposite side. But CAM's hypothesis is that this is essentially a differential amplifier. Because of the uh, effects of diffusion, these signals, these sort of 10% differences are relatively modest. And like many other examples of contrast uh, 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 enhancement in color vision and other areas like that, there's essentially a, a differential amplifier, a push-pull here, that, that one side, the stronger, more, more strongly activated side, will suppress the activity on, on the opposite side. And so the overall picture, again, is, is, that the, is that the nose is a lot more like vision and, and olfaction or an audition than we thought. There's a physical apparatus in the nasal cavity itself that seems to act actually a lot like the lens of the eye and that the different positions in the external world map to different positions on the nasal epithelium. And, and like the barn owl, you get a, actually four measurements, if you will, out of, the, out of your two nostrils, and that's enough. Uh, coupled together with, with what might be some clever circuitry to help you identify the source of, uh, of an odor. Again, I just want to acknowledge this is really the, the, the brainchild of, of Cam Kang. Um, he got some excellent help from Maiko Kuma, and we uh, collaborated on the EOG experiments with Hai Ching Zhao at Johns Hopkins. And I will now take questions.